Good afternoon, my name is Guy Withers, I'm the Artist Director and CEO of Waterbury Opera Festival. Uh, this afternoon I have the pleasure of being joined by Jonathan Dove, a composer and honorary patron of Waterbury Opera Festival, to have a little chat about Ariel, uh, a work uh, uh, that he composed and that we're going to be uh, staging at Waterbury uh, this summer in a few weeks time. Uh, good afternoon Jonathan. Hello. Um, thank you for joining me today in this beautiful park. Um, I'd just like to ask you, sort of give us a short introduction to uh, Ariel and uh, what that piece means to you. Mm. So Ariel is, um, you could call it a kind of monodrama. Um, right. In fact, it's quite often sung as a recital piece. It's something that can be just performed in a, in a concert, but actually it was originally written for a dramatic presentation. Um, more than 20 years ago, actually, in 1998, uh, the Delaware Pavilion in Bexhill was doing, I can't remember exactly, some kind of Shakespeare festival. There was a production, possibly of The Tempest itself, right. uh, in the main, in the main theatre. And friends of mine were involved in putting together a, a dramatic event in a kind of installation. Uh, so this involved uh, choreographer, dancer Claire Whistler, um, Alistair Middleton, uh, who is a regular collaborator of mine and uh, librettist of Mansfield Park. Yes, of um, course, yeah. But on this occasion he, he was creating the installation, uh, which was ah. a, an evocation of Prospero's Magic Island, uh, involving books that have mysteriously burned, um, a certain amount of fish, uh, things that have been <laughs> encrusted with salt from the sea. Uh, so, there was in, and in this installation, uh, Katie Tell was to sing. Um, Katie is now the uh, director of new music at Peter's Edition, but in those days, uh, she ran the education and outreach department of Glyndebourne. Um, but also has a, a wonderful soprano voice, very mm. very clear with very true pitch. Um, so. I wrote the piece for her to perform in some kind of interaction with uh, the, the, a figure that might be Prospero. Mm. It was um, not too specific, uh, and so it's a. I, I think it's a probably about twenty-minute piece, uh, which takes uh, well the three songs that Ariel sings in the Tempest, mm -hmm. uh, but also other speeches uh, so that you get hints and traces of the drama of the play and something of his relationship with Prospero. So it was because of this performance of the Tempest that, that you were commissioned to write that, this song cycle? Uh, that's right, but I had already been thinking about the Tempest as a subject for an opera. Uh, oh, right. Then a certain other composer beat me to it, so I oh, yes. didn't do that. But um, I, so it was, it was sort of, it was in my mind. Uh, I was going to do it as a kind of community opera. Um, I, don't, I hadn't got as far as imagining the actual music, but I just, I just thought about it. And a couple of years after writing Ariel, I did then go on to write the incidental music for a full production of the play uh, at the Almeida oh. Theatre, where I used to write a lot of music. Um, and on that occasion, the aerial was the actor Aidan Gillen, who sang all of the songs falsetto uh, at my request. Beautiful. And that was a completely different thing. But, um, so this was, yeah, I mean, the, the play itself is inherently very musical. And mm. I mean, apart from the songs, there's, yes. there's a, be not a fear, the aisle is full of noises. So you felt there was music inherent within, I mean, I, I agree that there's music inherent within Shakespeare's work. And of course, many of the, the plays have actual songs to be performed in them. Um, but there is other texts as well that's, from, that's used in Ariel. So where, where did you get those from? It's all, it's all things that he does say in the play. Yes. Uh, and things that uh, have to do with his uh, relationship with Prospero, he's always seeking for his for freedom, yes. to be released from the enchantment that binds him to Prospero. And that does happen finally at the very end of the play, which is when he sings Where the Bee Sucks, There Suck I. Yes. Uh, and the other, the other famous uh, lyrics are Full Fathom Five, Thy Father Lies, um, which is the second, and the first, Come Unto These Yellow Sands. And those are the things which are actually songs in the play. But a lot of what he says has lyrical possibilities. 
uh, or if you like, somewhat operatic mm. possibilities. Mm. Um, and so there's a, there's a scene where Ariel is kind of uh, bragging of what he's done so far. I, I boarded the king's ship, and yes. that's not a recitative. It's um, well, it's a kind of rather showing off song. Um, so yes, I, I sort of mind uh, a lot of the other speeches, but it's all Ariel's actual speeches uh, from from the Tempest. Um, and in setting this to music. Uh, is there a process that you go through every time you, you write music, um, but specifically for this story that you feel you... I, I noticed there's a lot of repetition, a lot of uh, almost sort of variation, and uh, it was that what you wanted to approach when, when sort of setting this, this uh, text to, well, to be sung? A, a significant thing about the context was that there were no, going to be no instruments. So that so was it's, a, it's a, a brief for you to not write? Yes, there was... Um, well. All we collectively decided, it, as it was 22 years ago, I can't remember exactly fair enough, fair um, enough. all of the, uh, the processes of, uh, and the choices we made, but, uh, but I knew it was going to be for the for unaccompanied soprano. As, as it happens, um, at the world premiere, uh, Katie actually lost her voice, so I had to sing the, the premiere. No! Um, oh, wow! <laughs> Maybe you should come this summer, in a special edition we could have Jonathan Dub performing, uh, Ariel. Right. Uh, I've often told people that no one would ever pay to hear me sing. Um, so, uh, <laughs> and, and of course I couldn't sing it at the pitch that I intended. Of course, so intended. you sang it sort of uh, as, as a tenor, presumably, yeah. Yes, that's yeah. what I intended. In a sense, some of what a, an orchestra might do mm. in an operatic context in terms of setting the scene and creating atmosphere, the singer has to do for herself. Yes. Um, and so some of the repetition uh, and some of the space in the piece is a chance to do that. So, I mean, the very first sounds you hear are shh. Yes. Uh, which could be just asking the audience to be hushed. Be but, quiet. Um, yeah. But it's, it's obviously <laughs> also the sound of the sea. Um, so, so Ariel has to bring his or her own scenery mm. along as well. So what was it like writing for an accompanied voice where there's nothing to support the singer? Is, that, is, there, is that a different challenge? A, a big difference for me is to do with the harmony and I oh, yeah. uh, often have quite a, a transparent, clear, often quite sort of triadic harmony uh, over which the voice can float, and I like to have an, you know, an, an accompaniment that may have a lot of variety of rhythm and texture, uh, and that it gives a space for the voice to then sort of float freely. But uh, so w uh, without instruments, uh, the voice has to create or imply its own harmonies. Um, Is an ambiguity there then uh, for the audience? audience's ear to not know where they're rooted musically um, is there a sense of a journey and not really and finding finding the end if, if you have a little context to understand that or, or do you feel like you're able to put that through the as you say the arpeggios of, of the singing yeah so I mean, when the soprano sings come on to these yellow sounds yeah she's quite clearly singing key, yes. a chord yes. really just uh, uh, drawn out or <laughs> again you just got two two harmonies in there, so, so that the harmony is very clear, but that was something new for me. So a mutual friend of ours, Katie, performed the, uh, the, the, the premiere of the work, and I, and I noticed that, that, that uh, her name is at the front of, of the piece, um, but was it because that she was lined up to perform the work that was written for a, a higher voice? Because Ariel sometimes is seen as either male or female, or, or actually majority male in productions. Uh, do you see an androgynous uh, character, or basically, why a soprano? <laughs> um, it, it was because we wanted Katie to right. sing the part. Um, but it does also give a more ethereal quality. Mm, yes. And as I mentioned, when I later went on to uh, write um, songs for a theatre production of a play, yes. um, I asked for a falsetto voice. Mm. Uh, I suppose that's, that more disembodied sound suggests mm. something of the ethereal and magical yes. nature of this spirit or sprite. Ariel is almost the perfect work for the current situation for us now. Um, you talk about forces and, and numbers 
it is right now in, in, in post lockdown uh, COVID 2020, uh, we are able to bring an audience into our gardens and space them out. And because it's just for one singer, we can adapt uh, what we have planned to do uh, and still have the full integrity of the work. And I think that's really fantastic. I mean, people who come to opera through let's say Wagner through the great pieces of the 19th century and are enthralled understandably by all the incredible colours that are available in the orchestra. Um, uh, maybe think of the orchestra as this, the essential part of opera but when opera began in the, in the Baroque period um, often the accompaniment is quite minimal and yes. really the voices are in the foreground mm -hmm. uh, and and the voices in the foreground for the bel canto tradition and, and I think that's probably where I belong. Uh, so a work like Ariel shows that actually you don't need an orchestra, that the singer is the most exciting thing, the most interesting thing, and the dramatic imagination of the performer uh, will communicate everything that you want. I absolutely agree. Uh, and I think many song cycles actually uh, feel like mini operas. I mean, Interizer being an example, but, but many others too. My question to you is, is Ariel, does it fit into the genre of opera then? If it is inherently dramatic and from, from a play and was performed at its premiere as a piece of physical uh, theatre and music, is, is it an opera? I've never really tried to define it. Um, it is perhaps both, like perhaps a somewhat operatic song cycle. Mm. Um, but I think really it's just its own thing. Good, good point. Um, so what are the boundaries between uh, opera and the song cycle? And did you feel like those things hold you back as a composer or, or do you sort of uh, completely discard them and write what you want? <laughs> I suppose the song cycle um, gives you a series of moments that imply a narrative. Yes. Um, opera joins those up more. And I guess a little bit more about the, the premiere that you mentioned. It sounds as if it was quite the event. Um, how did it go for you? Did the audience react well? <laughs> I think the audience enjoyed it enough, uh, but right in the front row, there was a boy very noisily eating crisps. And I didn't manage to distract him from that um, during the length of the performance. So uh, I, I think his magic was perhaps lost on some. And you've not since performed it again? <laughs> no, no. no. Has, has Katie performed it since? That's a good question. Well, I think she must have done, but um, the performances I've heard have been by other people in very different situations. I haven't, in fact, seen it staged uh, since then. Um, right. I've seen it performed using the space somewhat. Um, and I've seen it performed with a number of different singers in oh, right, okay. different aspects. That was a conservatoire performance where there were many sopranos available. Well, we're really looking forward to exploring that this summer. Uh, Rebecca's going to be staging the entire thing as if it, it were to live in, in the, uh, the Rose Garden, which I'm not sure you've seen before at Waterpay, uh, which is a beautiful sort of hedged garden mm -hmm. full of flowers. And so a much more sort of natural space than perhaps uh, a, a barren uh, seascape that you might get uh, in the Tempest or something. Uh, but it's uh, hopefully going to be a very dramatic lead, lead experience and uh, uh, hopefully the most intimate thing that people in the 20, 2020 are going to be able to experience because uh, obviously mm -hmm. theatres are, are closed and, and intimacy is um, re well, reduced with, with the social distancing and all that sort of thing. Well, I'm, I'm thrilled that it's happening. I'm really looking forward to seeing it. Wonderful.